tell me a little bit because I, I this book has really been capturing me. I've been it's been right here for sitting by my desk for the past couple of weeks. Do you mind telling me a little bit about the origin story? We'll say of the book. When did you first? I, I know you you write. I, I know you're very deliberate about when you choose to write something and why. So I'm wondering why you felt like this was the message that God had given you for this time. Yeah, I've been wrestling with this for a couple of years now. Um, I don't really like to write. <laughs> like if this is my last book, oh, that'd be great. Um, but really felt burdened. And uh, just the more I studied the scriptures and the more I saw God's desire for oneness in his body, uh, the more I was convicted that I was not doing enough and wanted to do everything within my power. I guess unity in the church was something I just, in a lot of ways, gave up on um, hmm. because it just seemed impossible. So why don't I just stay busy with things that I actually can do, you know? <laughs> but uh, uh -huh. the more I study the scriptures, the more I go, how? how can you neglect this? This is our calling. This is our privilege. This is, and this is the heart of God, you, you know? And so I just had to, and I didn't know if it was gonna be a book. I just needed to write down these thoughts, teach these thoughts, uh, video these thoughts, whatever I can do. Um, but really more than anything, pray that it would actually happen in my lifetime. So as something that you hear a lot, that, that I, we all hear a lot about this era is that it's the most divided we've ever been. We, we live in the most divisive time in history. I'm wondering if, A, given your your what you've read about, and as you said, I've thought about this, do you think that's true? And if so, or if a version of it is true, where are these divisions coming from? What What has made unity feel so impossible, to use your language? Yeah, I, it's kind of the same old thing. Um, it, there's, you know, the Bible says uh, in James that, you know, where selfish ambition exists, um, so will every vile practice. And so when there's something about me that is ambitious for my own things, not those things of God, uh, it's going to cause this this vile, weird, you, you know, uh, really when you look back at some of the divisions in the church, even from the early days, uh, there was, there was selfish ambition involved. Um, there was, uh, power involved. You know, you have the start of the Anglican church where there's a, you know, king that wants to get divorced and, you know, and uh, he's not allowed to. Well, then I'm just going to start my own church, yeah. you, you know, and and on and on it goes. And now we have people that are very ambitious to gain followers for themselves. And so this is where it gets weird is it's one thing when. You have the denominations, but then within the denominations, you have churches splintering off. And then within the churches, you have the churches splitting. But now every man for himself, I will, I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'll just start my own podcast, oh, sure. you know, yeah, yeah. and whoever wants to follow me, go for it. Cause I have the perfect balance and everyone else is off. And so it's giving a voice to everyone and everyone really thinking, we need to hear those voices. Um, and so now we have millions of voices. And I just wonder how many of us are really hearing, myself included, the voice of God. Do you think that social media has exacerbated this in any oh, way? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you, you think about it, some of it is just this clickbait generation mm -hmm. where unless I say something so strongly, like if I just said, oh, I had a nice interview with Tyler. Mm -hmm. um, who's going to click that? I had an interview with Tyler. He is the Antichrist. <laughs> I am sure of it. Well, you know, what's going to get more clicks? Yeah. And so you've got that going on along with uh, this really, I guess, selfish ambition, uh, you know, where they say, 
they said this years ago, so I don't know if it's true, but this generation wants fame more than they want riches. Hmm. Um, like they love having followers and being known. Mm -hmm. It's the new idol right now. Mm -hmm. So when we, so that's the, uh, you highlight the problem there, this, this, uh, mm. the selfish ambition there. What is mm. the opposite of this look like for us? How do mm. we, how systemically do we have to pivot away from our current mm. goals? Uh, I guess idols, you could yeah. even say, uh, what would that even look like? When the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? He said, say this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is. And it's, it's, it's going our father, not just Francis's dad, mm -hmm. me and Tyler, our father who's in heaven. My desire is that your name be lifted up. Be hallowed. I don't care what they think about Francis. Uh, today, I've got to figure out a way, even right now as we're talking, where people, you know, think less of me and more of him, like hallowed, like sacred. Uh, we've got to get to a point where all we're doing, like we must, must, must decrease. I've got to say things in a way that people are looking to God and not to me. Mm -hmm. And and so if that really is the desire of our hearts, we're going, God, I've got to figure out how to have fewer followers um, so that you have more. Because right now, if you put my name on, a, you know, on an advertisement, people will show up. If you put the name of Jesus, they will not. Hmm. So whose name is hallowed right now? Something is so off in that, and I've got to be a part of changing that. And so when we start in that place of, uh, you know, he must increase and I must, I must decrease. And instead of what I think we have in uh, the evangelical church today, which is a mindset that I must increase so that he can increase. Uh -huh. You yeah, know, like yeah, yeah. watch me because I'll point you to Jesus. Right. And it's like, no, 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 no. Right. Just, just stare at him, stare at him. We've got to figure out a way to get people in love directly with him. I've, I've sensed, and you've, I think, spoken very openly about throughout the course of your uh, career, the tension that you feel with this, because you don't, you, you very deliberately attempted to shun the people who are trying to give you influence or trying to make your name the biggest font on the poster and mm -hmm. the, uh, the book deals. And I'm aware this has been a, a real struggle for you. Uh, how have you dealt with that in your own life? And are there any lessons from that, that we, the rest of us could take and implement into our own lives? Yeah, first I would say when I get alone with God, uh, which is more and more often, I really think about his throne room. I really try to think about innumerable angels in agreement, just telling him how amazing he is and me just being on the outskirts. I go, yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. And it makes me go, I am so sorry when I've drawn any attention to myself, because this is the way it should be on earth. We're all staring at your throne. And I can't believe there have been times that I've wanted the attention and I fought for attention. And I'm so sorry for that. So I would say that is, uh, that is one of the main ways is just, it's my fear of God. It's my love of him. Um, and I guess the second thing lately for me is uh, a proper understanding of my role here on earth. In fact, I was talking to the elders of our church about this a couple of weeks ago, and we concluded that we are just the receptionists at the ER. No one should be coming to see us uh, uh, and having us fix their problems. And I just 
want to get people in a room with the great physician. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I need to, I, I, I don't need to be there. I have no business being in there. I just, I need to put you in a room with the great physician, let him do what he's supposed to do. And I don't believe that is the way pastors have seen themselves. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that's the way I've seen myself. Um, they come to me and well, let me do my best. And yeah, God is with me, but it, 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 there's never that moving on to where you get alone with God. And trust me, the great physician, he'll open you up, show you things that are messed up that I can't see as just a receptionist. Like we're, we're not, we're not making more of this intimacy they can have with God himself. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I think another obstacle to unity that I think is quite challenging, at least for me, I'm speaking for myself personally, um, which is that when you sense that somebody in the church, um, who is a member of either the, the capital C, the global church, or your own personal church, is is doing something wrong, and there are there mm-hmm. are issues, movements, beliefs that you feel very opposed to them that are maybe destructive, that that hurt the the cause of Christ in the world. How do we find? I don't even know if balance is the right word, but how how do we how do we maintain unity while also making sure that we are standing for um, things that we believe in, things that are important. Oh, that's, I'm glad you asked that because I, I think whenever you hear the word unity, there's a group of people in the Christian world that will say, oh, they're saying unity at the expense of truth yeah. or at the expense of holiness. And, oh, that is, that is the last thing I am saying. Um, God hates sin. And he, he, Christ died for sin. Uh, he wants the church to be pure. And he does tell us to, First uh, Corinthians 5, judge those within the church that are, you know, immoral, greedy, the swindlers, you know, like, like don't even associate with them. So he himself commands us to stay away uh, and don't even eat with the people who call themselves Christians and live that way. So that's how serious he is about sin. And then when it comes to truth, he tells us to, to beware of false teachers. Okay. So I am in no way saying, okay, yeah, let's just all get along. Let's stop uh, worrying so much about doctrine and worrying so much about sin. And he wants unity. No, I'm just saying that the people who typically fight for truth and fight for holiness seem to belittle this grand command for oneness that is at the heart of God. And we make unity like a cute little thing for baby Christians. But we scholars, um, we're going to deal with some bigger issues. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this was kind of the crux of the book came from Ephesians 4 where he explains that he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So there's something about maturity that brings unity. Earlier, he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He's talking about this gentleness and humility, all Hmm. humility and gentleness as we confront false teaching, as we instruct, we should instruct in a way that creates, not, not even create, maintains the unity that the spirit has started in us. Hmm. What would you, taking a slightly different track here, what would you say to people, and there's so many of them, we've heard from so many of them, irrelevant, I'm sure you've heard from these people as well, who want unity um, with people in their church, with maybe friends, family members who are also in the church, but um, but they feel like there's an alienation there, maybe owing to the political situation, possibly to religious uh, division. Uh, they, they are trying to figure out how to bridge that gap, but it just seems insurmountable um yeah where what do we do it is insurmountable (laughs) 
I mean, when it comes right down to it, this is going to take a miracle. Um, in fact, if you start pursuing unity, you are going to get hammered by the evangelical church. Um, there will be people that will be all over you. The moment you even consider or the moment you even have a conversation with someone outside of your circle. So just be aware of that. That's how bad it is. You don't even have to believe like they do just to be in a conversation with someone. And, ooh, I caught you talking to so-and-so. I saw you in a picture with this person. Mm -hmm. And it's like this cancel culture that really started in the church. Um, it... Uh, you're in for a battle, but here's here's what I will say. Uh, I think about Exodus 14 when uh, Moses is leading the people out of Egypt and they're backed up against the Red Sea and it's impossible. It's just impossible. An army's coming. You've got a couple rocks and a bunch of, you know, and this giant army is coming. There's no way out. And Moses said, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be quiet. And then this miracle happens. That's, that's what I'm believing for. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really believe that if we can just shut up, okay, not even come up with all of our plans and strategies, here's how we're going to do it. No, just can we learn to be quiet in the sacred presence of God again? Because if... If we could, like Ecclesiastes 5, just guard our steps when we go to the house of God, not to say anything, but just to stand in awe of God. It's like Bonhoeffer said in Life Together, like if you don't have that time with the Lord, then whenever you do go to the church and open your mouth, it's actually going to ruin the church. You're actually going to hurt it by sharing your thoughts and opinions that come from a place that isn't deep in the heart of God. Are you hopeful for the future of the church here on earth? I really am. I really am. Like, I, I you know, even, even two months ago, I'd be like, ah, you know, <laughs> but lately I just, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing a younger generation. I mean, many that are walking away, um, but there are those who are saying, it doesn't make sense the way it is. Um, we got to go all or nothing. Um, as I'm spending this time, with the Lord, God is giving me passages to meditate on the key one being John 13 through 17. And what's crazy is I've had a couple of friends going, no way. That is exactly what God has told me. Hmm. John 13 to 17. We're not fascinated with this enough. And I don't want to move past it. In fact, this may be all I teach for the next couple of years mm -hmm. if the Lord tarries. Uh, and so it's like, whoa, really? You too? You too? Like it's, there's something in that. And it would be awesome if God uses his scriptures and uh, believers everywhere are just going, I just want to marvel at these truths. I want to know these truths before I leave this earth this oneness that I can have with almighty God and with one another. I have not marveled at these mysteries enough. And so it makes me hopeful. It's like, God, are you prodding other people? Um, because like Ephesians four says, we should be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to start a movement or something. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, God, because the spirit is in me, I desire oneness. And I think it's happening around the world. And now let's be eager to maintain what the spirit has started. And if he's speaking John 13, 17 to you at the same time as saying it to me, I'm pretty sure there's something in this, you know, of his final discourse that we need to know. And I believe if we really know and internalize this passage, uh, it's going to go a long, 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 long way toward unity.